that's, uh, that's just like the welcome I received when I went to Blackwater's founder's hometown. <laughs> Almost identical. When his uncle came up to me and told me to stop messing with Eric Prince because he's doing the Lord's work with Blackwater. <laughs> that's not a joke. Um, I, I, I want to begin, first of all, by uh, thanking the organizers of this conference. You know, I, not all of us share the same ideology uh, or necessarily share the same uh, political view of what it means to be in a movement. Uh, but I think all of us uh, are united on basic principles of opposing this war, of calling for economic justice, of being against the death penalty, of uh, believing that those who do harm to others do not speak for the people of this country. And I want to thank all of you for being here. And it's, it's so great when you look at the roster of people speaking, the, the veterans who are coming back and sharing stories. And it's so important uh, to hear that testimony uh, of those that have been on the front lines in Iraq and are coming back and saying no uh, to the war. And I think that it's important that so many veterans are rising up and calling for an immediate withdrawal from Iraq, not 18 months, not six months, not 40,000 troops and 160,000 mercenaries, but an immediate withdrawal from Iraq. And so thank you to those vets who bravely have stood up. I also want to extend a personal thank you to Anthony Arnov, who uh, was my agent on this book and reviewed the manuscript many times. Without Anthony's uh, incredible dedication, this book would have never happened. And I want to personally thank you, Anthony, for all your work. <laughs> Anthony told me in 1995 that I needed to write a book. And at that point, it was on something else. And every year since, he's come up with a different idea. And finally, we found one that landed. <laughs> well, I, I want to. Uh, begin tonight by reading a short section uh, from the book. I promise you I won't read any more sections from the book, but I want to open up with something that was the uh, definitive uh, moment in many ways of the Iraq occupation as of uh, the spring of 2004. And many of you probably remember this incident. It would prove incredibly pivotal in the course that the war and the occupation would take. And it happened on the morning of March 31st, 2004 in the Iraqi city of Fallujah. When the four Americans rolled into Fallujah in their two Piero jeeps, the Iraqi Mujahideen and the city of mosques were waiting for them. The main drag that cuts through the city is lined with restaurants, cafes, and souks, and on ordinary days, throngs of people mill around. But early that morning, a small group of masked men had detonated an explosive device, clearing the streets and causing shopkeepers to shutter their stores. From the moment the convoy of Americans entered the city limits of Fallujah, the men stood out. They were driving vehicles known widely in Iraq as bullet magnets. They were sporting wraparound sunglasses and Tom Cruise haircuts. Shortly after they entered Fallujah, the jeeps began to slow. To their right were shops and markets. To the left, open space. They'd hit some sort of a roadblock. As the vehicles came to a standstill, a grenade was hurled at the rear jeep, quickly followed by the rip of machine gun fire. Bullets tore through the side of the rear pyro like salt through ice, fatally wounding the two men inside. As the blood gushed from them, masked gunmen moved in on the jeeps, unloading cartridges of ammo and pounding their way through the windshield. Chants of Allah Akbar, God is great, filled the air. Soon more than a dozen young men who'd been hanging out in front of a local kebab house joined in the frenzy. By the time the rear jeep was shot up, the Americans in the lead vehicle realized that an ambush was underway. They tried to flee or to turn around and help their wounded comrades, but it was too late. The crowd quickly swelled to more than 300 people as the original attackers faded into the side streets of Fallujah. The jeeps were soon engulfed in flames, and men and boys literally tore the men apart limb from limb. In front of TV cameras, a young man held a small sign emblazoned with a skull and crossbones that declared in English, Fallujah is the graveyard of the Americans. The mob hung the charred, lifeless remains of the men from a bridge over the Euphrates River where they would remain for hours, forming an eerily iconic image that was seen on television screens throughout the world. Thousands of miles away in Washington, D.C., President Bush was on the campaign trail speaking at a fundraiser dinner. This collection of killers is trying to shake our will, the president told his supporters. America will never be intimidated by thugs and assassins. We're aggressively striking the terrorists in Iraq. We will defeat them there so we do not have to face them in our own country. The next morning, Americans woke up to the news of the gruesome killings. 
Iraqi mob mutilates four American civilians. It was a typical newspaper headline. In fact, it was the headline of the Chicago Tribune. Somalia was frequently invoked, referring to the incident in October of 1993 when rebels in Mogadishu shot down two Black Hawk helicopters, killed 18 U.S. soldiers, and dragged some of them through the streets, prompting the Clinton administration to withdraw forces. But unlike Somalia, the men killed at Fallujah were not members of the U.S. military, nor were they civilians, as many news outlets reported. They were highly trained private soldiers sent to Iraq by a secretive mercenary company based in the wilderness of North Carolina. Its name is Blackwater USA. I think for many people, even those who very closely uh, follow the war and follow U.S. foreign policy, it came as some news that there were these heavily armed private soldiers operating in Iraq. Most of the public that was paying attention had heard of Halliburton, which is the largest uh, war contractor, primarily because of the relationship between Halliburton and Vice President Dick Cheney. Of course, Cheney was the head of Halliburton, then he became the vice president, and Halliburton gets all these no-bid contracts and favorable financial arrangements. But this idea of armed mercenaries working on behalf of the U.S. government in a war zone was a relatively new development. Of course, the Central Intelligence Agency and other agencies had used uh, mercenaries for covert operations. They were used in Vietnam, they've been used throughout history, but never in the scope that we're seeing right now in Iraq. Most people in this country believe that there are about 145,000 to 170,000 U.S. troops on the ground in Iraq right now. What's almost never mentioned in the public discourse or debate on this issue is the fact that there are 130,000 private personnel deployed alongside those 145,000 active duty U.S. forces. This is an effective doubling of the size of the occupation force. And why does the Bush administration want to use these private personnel. Well, first of all, we know that over 4,000 U.S. soldiers have died in Iraq. We know that over 25,000 have been wounded. I actually think the number is much higher, but that's the conservative estimate of the military. We don't know how many of these mercenaries have been killed serving the occupation in Iraq. We know that at least 917 of them have died in Iraq since March of 2003. 917. We know that in the first three months of this year, about 146 of them died. Those numbers are not included in the official death count. They help to mask the toll of the war. Now, I said that we know that 917 have died. The reason we know that is because their families have applied for federal death benefits under something called the Defense Base Act. So only those private personnel whose families have applied for these death benefits, only through the Department of Labor are we able to track these forces. But what's more disturbing is that the Bush administration uses these forces and approaches their use very differently than the use of active duty U.S. soldiers. If you're, a, if you're a soldier in Iraq and you extrajudicially kill an Iraqi, you could be court-martialed for it. Now, there have been 64 courts martial of U.S. soldiers in Iraq on murder-related charges alone, a, a stunningly low number given the severity of the crimes that we've seen unfold in Iraq. But there have been 64 courts martial on murder-related charges. With hundreds of thousands of private personnel working for companies like DynCorp, Triple Canopy, Blackwater, KBR, Fleur, Aranus, Armor Group, the list goes on and on. Hundreds of thousands of contractors, as they're called now, working for these companies have gone in and out of Iraq. 64 U.S. soldiers court-martialed on murder-related charges. Out of those 100,000, 100,000, 100,000 contractors going in and out of the country, two have been prosecuted for any crimes. One of them pled guilty to possession of child pornography images on his computer at Abu Ghraib prison. The other was a KBR employee accused of stabbing a coworker in a kitchen. Neither of the contractors prosecuted were charged with crimes against Iraqi, Iraqis, and neither of them were armed contractors like those that work for Blackwater. So either we have tens of thousands of the most saintly Boy Scout mercenaries running around Iraq, or something is fundamentally wrong with the system. You see, what the Bush administration has done is to replace whatever semblance or concept of diplomacy existed anymore in this country. The idea in the original Gulf War 1991 of Bush's father was, I'm going to build a coalition of willing nations. And he got a, a number of Arab nations on board, and the key one was Saudi Arabia. 
Well, Bush failed to build a coalition of willing nations, so instead he built a coalition of billing corporations. And those billing corporations have descended on Iraq to a point where the Times of London said that the post-war boom in Iraq is not oil, it's private security. And by using the private sector to service your war, you take away the constraints of the nation state. And you now make your pool of potential soldiers or cannon fodder for your war the poor of the world. So companies like Blackwater can go in and aggressively recruit in Latin America and hire up mercenaries from companies with countries with, see the slip, countries with horrible human rights records and then deploy them in Iraq as part of this so-called coalition of the willing. Now I'm going to return to all of this bigger picture in a little while, but what I want to do now is, is talk a little bit about the origins of Blackwater, who started it, uh, who are the men that are running the company, and what are they looking to uh, for tomorrow. You see, Blackwater is one of 180 mercenary companies that are operating in Iraq right now. It's not the biggest of them. It's not the most profitable. Yes, 180 mercenary companies. And when I say mercenary, I don't mean KBR. You can make an argument that KBR is a mercenary force, but their forces aren't armed. There are 181 companies operating in Iraq right now that provide private, heavily armed soldiers. Blackwater is viewed not as the Ford of the industry, but as the Maserati. There's less of them, but they're considered more desirable. Blackwater was founded by a man named Eric Prince. Eric Prince is uh, believed to be one of the wealthiest people ever to serve in the elite U.S. Navy SEALs. He comes from the state of Michigan, just across the lake here, from a town called Holland. And his father was a, a, a very successful businessman. During the 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, in Michigan, he built up a company called Prince Manufacturing. And Prince Manufacturing was perhaps best known for an invention that many people have in their cars as they drive around today, the now ubiquitous lighted sun visor. If you pull down the visor in your car and it lights up, you have a bit of Blackwater's history riding around in your vehicle. So Eric Prince grows up in this house where his father is running this billion dollar uh, business. But more important than watching his dad run the business, was watching him use the company as a cash generating engine to fuel and fund the rise of the Republican Revolution of 1994 and the rise of what we now know as the radical religious right in this country. It was Eric Prince's father, Edgar Prince, who gave the seed money to Gary Bauer to start the Family Research Council. Eric Prince was in the first team of interns that Gary Bauer took on. Gary Bauer, of course, is not just a radical religious right leader, he was one of the original signers of the Project for a New American Century, the neoconservative agenda that was adopted by the Bush White House. They also gave substantial funding and support to James Dobson and his focus on the Family Prayer Warrior Network. Eric Prince's sister, uh, Betsy, married Dick DeVos, who ran for governor in the state of Michigan recently and lost to Jennifer Granholm. Uh, of course, he ran as a Republican. Uh, Dick DeVos was the heir to the Amway Corporation fortune. Amway was the single greatest bankroller of the Republican Revolution. Many say it was a company that was run by like a cult that used its uh, marketing uh, team spread out across the country as a, a, a sort of uh, political engine to try to overthrow what they saw as secularist politicians in the United States. Uh, and so these two families, the DeVos family and the Prince family, they merged together when Betsy Prince married Dick DeVos. And they, and they merged in the kind of marriage that was commonplace in the monarchies of, of old Europe. And together they formed a formidable, behind-the-scenes power player in radical right-wing politics in this country. Eric Prince was an early intern at George H.W. Bush's White House, but he complained that it wasn't conservative enough for him on gay issues, on the budget, on the environment, were the three issues that he cited. He also was an intern for Dana Rohrabacher, one of the biggest lunatics in the Congress. Dana Rohrabacher was, a, was an advisor to Ronald Reagan and was a, uh, a senior speechwriter for Reagan. Rohrabacher gets elected to Congress after leaving the Reagan White House, and in the three months between the election and the beginning of his term, he flies over to Afghanistan to fight on the side of the Mujahideen against the Soviets uh, and, 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 and continues to brag about this. These were the people that peppered the landscape of young Eric Prince's upbringing, the man who would go on to found Blackwater. Now, in 1995, Eric Prince had been in the Navy SEALs for a number of years. It had been his dream to be in the U.S. military, and he had deployments in Bosnia, uh, in Haiti, in the Mediterranean. But in, in 95, his father died suddenly of a heart attack in the elevator of the, the family business, and Eric Prince's young wife had cancer, and he goes back to Michigan to help the family sort through the business. And at the funeral of Edgar Prince, the two main eulogies for him given were by Bauer and Dobson. 
And they came and they, they talked about how Edgar Prince stepped in at a moment when the Supreme Court was trying to uh, make abortion the law of the land and, and came in at a crucial moment and, and was the major fundraiser and the fund provider uh, for the organizations that now make up the religious right in this country. So Eric Prince sits down with his family after his father's death and they try to decide what to do with the family business and ultimately after deliberation they decide to sell it for $1.3 billion in cash. They sold it to Johnson Controls. Johnson Controls sent the jobs uh, out of the country. And, and the Prince family divides up the money. Eric Prince then goes out to North Carolina, teams up with a bunch of, uh, a small group of other guys that he had met in the special forces, and together they begin building what would be called Blackwater Lodge and Training Center. At the beginning, it was nothing more than about 5,000 acres of land spread over two counties in North Carolina and the vision of Eric Prince. They began to build up that company uh, and they incorporated it in late 96. They build it up through 97. It's a fairly quiet time. In 98, they have their grand opening and there are two special congressional guests. Dana Rohrabacher is flown out for the grand opening and John Doolittle, uh, another uh, right-wing, very right-wing Republican congressman from California. And their, their reason for being at Blackwater's grand opening in the, in the literature at the time was that they were staunch defenders of the Second Amendment. And so the, the original concept of Blackwater, uh, by all accounts, had nothing to do with providing mercenary services. It was, it was supposed to be Blackwater Lodge and Training Center. And the idea was it was going to be a sportsman's paradise, a place where gun enthusiasts could come and fire off their weapons. But then early literature of the company also indicated that they intended to take advantage of what they saw as the coming accelerated government outsourcing of security and firearms related training. And, and in 1998, Blackwater had not much business at all. But then in 1999, the first of what would be almost annual tragedies that would end up benefiting Blackwater would take place, and that was the Columbine shootings in April of 1999. Blackwater responded to Columbine by erecting a mock high school on their compound on the Great Dismal Swamp of North Carolina, and they called it Are You Ready High, like the letter R, letter U, Are You Ready High? And they invited law enforcement agents from around the country to come to Moyoc, North Carolina at Blackwater and train in how to face down against the violent youth of America. In fact, recently they've been uh, talking about how Blackwater could have been helpful in the Virginia Tech shootings. Yeah. So then the next year, the next tragedy that would take place would be the bombing of the USS Cole off the coast of Yemen. Many of you probably remember that. It was portrayed at the time as one of the worst so-called peacetime attacks. Tell the people of Iraq living under sanctions it was peacetime. Uh, the, one of the worst peacetime attacks against a U.S. vessel in, in, in recent history. And the Navy responded to that attack, which killed a number of sailors, by awarding Blackwater a $35.7 million contract to train sailors in how to face down against attacks against their uh, vessels or their ships. In 2000, Blackwater was given its federal vending license by the Clinton administration. You know, anyone who thinks that, 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 you know, that, that the, the problems of the world began with Bush is incredibly naive. You can erase 9-11 from the equation and you have a solid trajectory that goes from Reagan to Bush to Clinton to Bush. And, and, uh, and that's been the case with Blackwater too. The Clinton administration awards Blackwater its federal vending license. And one former CIA operative told us for the book, once you get that license, it's like you enter the Walmart of government shopping. It gives you permission to market your goods and services to any agency of the federal government. And so, I, you know, a lot of us talk about money and politics, but it's, fast, it's a fascinating window into how this works. You get the permission to be a vendor, and then the game becomes, who do you know, and how well do you grease the wheels? And that's where, when we fast forward to the Bush administration, we look at Blackwater making an enormous amount of money. So under Clinton, they're given this federal vending license. At the beginning, the federal government estimated that Blackwater was going to, was going to gross uh, about $125,000 over five years. By the time six years had elapsed, they'd grossed over $100 million. And, and one, one spokesperson for the, the government said to me, well, they, they were incredibly good at marketing their services. Um, and so, but in 2001 was when the crucial event happened that would make Blackwater's uh, fate uh, incredibly profitable. And that was, of course, 9-11. Eric Prince, the founder of Blackwater, he doesn't hold press conferences. He's very rarely interviewed. Uh, he recently wrote an op-ed that I'm going to talk about in, in a little while. But he did make one television appearance right after 9-11. And you might be able to guess the network he appeared on, you know, Fox News. You might be able to guess the show, O'Reilly Factor. 
So, so Eric Prince is on the O'Reilly Factor, and he was talking about the Federal Air Marshal Program. And, uh, and they, you know, they, at the time there was this debate, you know, should we have armed marshals on every flight, et cetera. But Prince also said something that was fascinating. He, he said on that program, I was starting to get a little cynical about how seriously people took the business of security and training. Now, Eric Prince said, the phone is ringing off the hook. One of the early calls that came into Blackwater uh, was from the Central Intelligence Agency, which contracted Eric Prince's men to send a small team of special forces operators inside of Afghanistan during the early stages of U.S. operations there. They positioned themselves near a CIA outpost in Shkin, near the border with Pakistan. Eric Prince himself went over with that Blackwater team. That, to my knowledge, is the first time that we see Blackwater crossing the line from being the sportsman's paradise and a, and a training facility to being an all-out mercenary force. But the real serious money for Blackwater wouldn't uh, start pouring in until U.S. tanks rolled into Baghdad in March of 2003. When the U.S. began occupying Iraq, the Bush administration deployed the largest army of private personnel ever deployed in a modern war zone alongside the official occupation force. During the 1991 so-called Gulf War, you had a ratio of 60 soldiers to every one contractor. Right now, we're almost at a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, this, this is not some accident of history. This was an intentional plan uh, that was set in motion in 1993 when Dick Cheney was the Defense Secretary under George H.W. Bush. He commissioned a division of Halliburton, the company he would go on to head, uh, to do a study on how to privatize the military bureaucracy. That accelerated the use of the logistical civilian program known as Log Cap. So KBR is the biggest log cap contractor now in Iraq. The Clinton administration picked up Cheney's ball. While Cheney was heading Halliburton, Clinton was accelerating the privatization of the military and the national security apparatus of the United States. And Cheney was heading Halliburton and hanging out at the American Enterprise Institute. And Rumsfeld was at the American Enterprise Institute. And they were pressuring, uh, as it was uh, portrayed in the press, pressuring Clinton to sign the Iraq Liberation Act. And of course, he did that. And so you see that trajectory. This wasn't something that, that Bush invented. This was something that was bipartisan. And so when the tanks roll in, they have this army almost one to one of contractors to soldiers. And they send in uh, a, a neoconservative slash neoliberal quote unquote terror expert. Of course, it takes one to know one, Paul Bremer, uh, who hits the ground in Iraq with the, uh, it appeared to be the, the sole objective of destroying the country, destroying its economy, destroying the military, uh, destroying civil society in Iraq and creating bedlam and, and chaos. So Bremer hits the ground. He, of course, had worked for Henry Kissinger, one of the biggest terrorists in the world, uh, and, and he hits the ground running in Iraq. But instead of the U.S. military protecting Paul Bremer, they give a no-bid contract to a private mercenary company for $27 million, and that company was Blackwater USA. So Blackwater would be charged with the all-important job of keeping the most hated man in, alive, uh, in Iraq alive during his time there. One of the earliest things that Paul Bremer did was to institute, and, and, and veterans know the, the consequences of this, Bremer instituted a disastrous policy known as debathification. They, they were so intent on making this comparison between Saddam Hussein and Hitler, denazification, debathification. And, and it all sounds, you know, it, 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 it sounds like one could make an argument that it, it made sense. You're just going to take out Saddam Hussein's top cadre of people and then, you know, and, and, and punish them and put them on trial. No, what debathification meant was that nurses, uh, engineers, teachers, all of these people who had any loose affiliation with the Ba'ath Party. I spent a lot of time in Saddam Hussein's Iraq. It was very difficult to find someone who had not, at some point or another in life, been forced to sign some kind of paper supporting the Ba'ath Party. They fired hundreds of thousands of workers who were simple civilians who were going about their daily lives. They fired people from the Ministry of Education. They fired uh, the, the people who were in charge of reconstruction projects in the country. But also they fired 250,000 Iraqi soldiers. From one day to the next, they stopped paying them. We quote one senior U.S. official in the book as saying that it was the day we made a quarter of a million armed enemies in Iraq. Some of the leaders of the Iraqi military marched on the gates of the Green Zone and they said, this is a disaster. You can't stop paying our men. They'll all join the ranks of the resistance and rise up against you. Of course, no one listens. And so we saw a direct escalation in the attacks against U.S. forces that occurred right after the debathification policies were implemented. And so as Bremer is, is running around earning himself nicknames like Little Saddam and Saddam after Saddam, it's Blackwater that's protecting him and keeping him alive. And in fact, when Bremer skulked out of Baghdad after a year in the country, 
he handed over sovereignty to an Iraqi government, and then he gave a thank you gift to Blackwater and other contractors, as they're called, the 130,000 Shadow Army uh, in Iraq. He, granted a, he, he issued an edict known as Order 17, which granted sweeping immunity to all contractors from prosecution in Iraqi courts. That's a strange definition of sovereignty. And so Bremer leaves the country. And, and if you think about the psychology of a private company guarding Bremer versus the U.S. military, it goes something like this. If the military is guarding Paul Bremer or Zalmay Khalilzad or John Negroponte, and they get killed, there will be an investigation. It will be a scandal. Maybe there will be a court-martial if they figure out that someone did something really outrageous. But nothing much is going to come of it. There's not going to be high-stakes consequences for the military. But if a private company loses Paul Bremer, it would wipe out their business. And the very fact that Blackwater kept Bremer alive, the most hated man in Iraq for a year, they've now used that as a marketing tool to win more business. If you go to Blackwater Security Consulting's website, you see Paul Bremer's face all over the website. And the, the message is clear. If we can keep him alive, we can do anything for your government or your business in Iraq. So Blackwater, that was the, the gold rush moment for Blackwater, was that initial contract. Now I told you about that Fallujah ambush at the beginning where those four guys were killed. They were killed on March 31, 2004. On April 1, 2004, Eric Prince hires the Alexander Strategy Group, which is the most, well, at the time, was one of the most powerful Republican lobbying firms on K Street. It was one of the jewels of Tom DeLay's K Street project. The Alexander Strategy Group had been founded and was staffed by former senior staffers of Tom DeLay. Jack Abramoff was connected to the Alexander Strategy Group. It was a major power broker. Within days of hiring the Alexander Strategy Group, Blackwater executives, Eric Prince and others, find themselves in a series of face-to-face -face meetings with the men who literally ran Congress in both the House and in the Senate. March 31st, 2004, four Blackwater operatives killed in Fallujah, Iraq. April 1st, 2004, Alexander Strategy Group hired. By June of 2004, Blackwater was awarded an incredible $320 million contract to provide so-called diplomatic security services in Iraq. It has now risen out of the great dismal swamp of North Carolina and the rubble of 9-11 to become one of the most powerful private actors in the so-called war on terror. The number two man uh, at Blackwater is a guy named Jay Kofer Black. He's probably a name that some of you have heard. Jay Kofer Black was, is one of the most uh, well-known spies in U.S. history, 30 years in the Central Intelligence Agency. He began his work in Africa. Uh, where he was in Rhodesia and other places, and then he was in Sudan in the mid-1990s where he was once marked for death by Osama bin Laden. And while he was there, it, it came up with a plot to kill bin Laden and to throw his body over the gates of the Iranian embassy to try to make it appear as though the Iranians had killed Osama bin Laden. Kofor Black was, uh, was a well-known spy, and on 9-11, he was the head of the Central Intelligence Agency's Counterterrorism Center. He was the top counterterrorism official at the CIA, the man who would be tasked with the hunt for bin Laden. Great job. So he goes in on September 13th, 2001, and he meets in the White House Situation Room with President Bush, and he's throwing papers on the ground as he's describing how he's going to insert special forces inside of Afghanistan. And he says, Mr. President, when we're through with them, they're going to have flies crawling across their eyeballs. Flies crawling across their eyeballs. He became known as the flies on the eyeball guy within the administration. He goes over to Moscow with Deputy Secretary of State Dick Armitage, Colin Powell's deputy, ahead of the invasion of Afghanistan, and they meet with the Russian diplomats, and the Russians start to warn them about the Soviet experience in Afghanistan, and Kofor Black shoots back at them, we're going we're gonna to put their heads on pikes. In fact, his orders, this is a man seemingly obsessed with corporal mutilation, his orders to the jawbreaker team from the CIA that went into Afghanistan initially was literally to find Osama bin Laden, take a machete, whack off his head, put it in a box on dry ice, and bring it back so he could present it to President Bush. And when he, was, when he gave those orders to the jawbreaker team, the, the head of the jawbreaker team says, the orders are crystal clear, Kofor. Uh, we can get a cardboard box. I don't know what we're going to do about dry ice, but we'll make it work. <laughs> Kofor Black, and as I'm telling you this, remember, he's now the number two man at Blackwater, and, and Blackwater has an aviation division of more than 20 aircraft. Kofor Black was perhaps the central figure in escalating the use of, of what are known as extraordinary renditions, government-sanctioned kidnap and torture programs, where people are snatched off the streets of cities around the world, zipped up, 
shackled to the seat of an airplane, sent to a third country hellhole to be tortured, unless you think it just happens in Afghanistan and Kandahar elsewhere. Uh, Maher Arar was abducted at JFK airport and sent to Syria where he was systematically tortured under that program. So Kofor Black is a, the man who stands in front of Congress and says there's a before 9-11 and an after 9-11, and after 9-11 the gloves come off. It's a chilling statement from this man who's now number two at Blackwater USA. In fact, Mitt Romney just tapped him to be his senior counterterrorism advisor for his presidential campaign. Kofor Black's most recent initiative is something that, that is a glimpse into the future, uh, and that is privatized intelligence. Kofor Black is, and, and another uh, senior Blackwater executive, Robert Richer, who's the former deputy director of operations at the CIA, and then another former senior CIA official, Enrique Rick Prado, are the three people at the center of something called Total Intelligence Solutions. It's like a privatized CIA, and it's being bankrolled by Eric Prince at Blackwater. These frightening individuals who talk about chopping off heads, gloves coming off, who support and, and, and are actively, have actively participated in the torture and abduction of people, are now privatizing their CIA careers and marketing them to Fortune 500 companies. This is an extraordinarily frightening development, and we see it as a trend. These private intelligence companies are popping up across the board. There are a number of other figures at Blackwater that I could talk about. I, I realize I'm, I'm short on time, so I want to run through a couple of other things that I think are, are crucial to discuss. Um, one is that uh, Eric Prince uh, wrote, a, uh, wrote an op-ed called Nothing Mercenary About Blackwater Activities. He finally, finally speaks up, and he says, um, Clearly, the mercenary label is intended to polarize the discussion and craft the most negative image possible of Blackwater. The highest authority on rhetoric, the Oxford English Dictionary, however, defines mercenary as, quote, a professional soldier serving a foreign power. Blackwater does not now, nor has it ever, provided security services for or on behalf of any country other than the United States of America. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I find this fascinating that this is the definition that Eric Prince uses to describe a mercenary. He says it's a professional soldier serving a foreign government. A professional soldier serving a foreign power. Blackwater, beginning in 2003, started working with a recruiter in Chile, a guy who had been in Pinochet's military. I tracked him down and interviewed him for two and a half hours, and he explained to me how the whole Latin American recruitment operation worked for Blackwater. This guy, his name is Jose Miguel Pizarro Ovalle. He starts working with Blackwater. He opens up some camps in Chile. He puts out ads in the paper seeking former commandos, special forces operators. In Chile, Pinochet's man is now looking for former special forces operators and commandos to work for an American company in Iraq. The day after he put that ad in the paper, he had over 1,000 people respond to it. He sets up these camps. He begins evaluating soldiers. He tells me three Blackwater officials come down, and they evaluate the soldiers. By February of 2004, Chilean mercenaries were heading up to Moyak, North Carolina, before sent, being sent over to Iraq. In all, this man told me that he provided 756 Chilean mercenaries to Blackwater, Triple Canopy, and a couple of other uh, countries, uh, companies. Now, what's interesting about this is that Chile, of course, knows suffering well at the hands of the United States economically, militarily, the rise of the brutal regime of Pinochet, the devastating economic policies of the Chicago boys. But what's interesting about Chile in 2003 was that it was a rotating member of the UN Security Council opposing the invasion of Iraq. 92% of Chileans were against the invasion and occupation of Iraq. Chile said no to the coalition of the willing. And so the Bush administration turns to Blackwater and the coalition of the billing, and they go in and they violate the sovereignty of the nation of Chile, and they hire up their thuggish human rights abusing soldiers that are leftovers from the Pinochet era, and they send them over to Iraq to work as part of the occupation force. They also went into Colombia, and they recruited Colombian mercenaries. Similar operation, putting out the ads, always promising more money than you're going to end up getting paid. The Colombians arrive in, in Baghdad, in the green zone, and they finally read the final contract. It had been changed a number of times, and they find out they're getting paid $34 a day. Some of the best paid U.S. mercenaries get $1,000 a day. The Colombians, $34 a day. The Bulgarians working for Blackwater start laughing at the Colombians and saying no one comes here for $1,000 a month. So the Colombians staged a strike of sorts inside of the green zone. Well, fast forward a little bit in time here. A couple weeks ago, the, the Colombian recruiter 
who sent them over to Iraq was gunned down in the streets of Bogota. So what we, what we see here is, 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 is an insidious uh, system where you want to avoid having a draft in your country. You want to keep it off the table for political reasons. You can't convince the world to participate in your global wars of conquest. And so what you do is you make the whole world your recruiting ground. You use these private companies to go into the poorest countries of the world, countries that have been systematically destabilized by the United States, and you hire up the poor of the developing world, and you deploy them to kill and be killed in Iraq against the poor and suffering of Iraq. And, and the fact is that, that, that there's also a racist element to this too in the pay structure of them. We've got American mercenaries, U.S. mercenaries in Iraq right now. They make more money than Secretary Gates. They make more money than the commanding generals. To tell you how pervasive this privatization agenda is, General David Petraeus in January when he testified in front of the Senate admitted that he on his last tour in Iraq had been guarded not by the U.S. military but by British mercenaries. And so we, we have a situation right now where we had years of Republican-dominated Congress, and now pe a lot of people thought, oh, the Democrats are in the Congress, and everything's going to be great, and they're going to stop the war. And, and instead, all they've continued to do is to fund it at a 100% level, in fact, at times offering the president even more money than he was asking for. There are a handful of Democrats who are nobly taking on the issue of the privatization of war, but, but you know their names probably. And, 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 and here, here's the fact that we have the Uniform Code of Military Justice being applied to soldiers, and we have almost no law whatsoever being applied to the contractors. So the Democrats come up with a plan, and this is their idea. We're going to send an FBI field unit over to Iraq. So we're going to deploy more forces in Iraq. And, and somehow this FBI field unit is going to monitor the activities of 130,000 private personnel in the war zone. I mean, have you ever heard of a more ridiculous plan? They, we have enough trouble keeping track of what the official U.S. military does. The Democrats' best laid plan is to send the FBI over to Baghdad to monitor the mercenaries, men who are sent to places no one else will go or wants to go. And, and, and I interviewed the, 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 the person who thought up this legislation, David Price, who's a Democrat from North Carolina. And I said to him, Representative Price, let me ask you, who's going to protect the investigators as they go around Iraq? Uh, <laughs> How are you going to interview Iraqi victims of contractors if they're in, say, uh, Hilla or Bakuba or places that are difficult for the U.S. military to get into? Who, who's going to do the translating for all of these investigators? And then who's going to arrest these contractors, some of, many of them former Navy SEALs, and then send them back to the United States where they're going to be prosecuted in a, in a U.S. court? He, well, those are very good questions. As though he had never thought of that before. And, and, and so that, that's the state of affairs when it comes to the, to the privatization of war agenda in the mainstream of the Democratic Party uh, in the U.S. Congress. I was actually invited to testify in front of Congress, in front of the Defense Appropriations Committee. And uh, the, the night before I testified, uh, I got a call from the committee uh, saying that at least 10 of the most powerful private war companies in the United States had called the committee and demanded that I not testify. Uh, and, uh, and then they said, well, okay, if he's going to testify, then, then one of our lobbyists has to appear. You know, their lobbyists are constantly on Capitol Hill. I've been there like three times in my life. And so Jim Moran, a Democrat from Virginia, very bravely said to them, no, no, we're going to do this and we're going to have this hearing. And so we, we had that hearing and it was, uh, it was web stream. C-SPAN, of course, didn't cover it. And the only people in the room besides... Uh, the, the Democrats on the committee was one lone Republican congressman, the Republicans boycotted, Jack Kingston, the single most conservative member of the Congress from Georgia, and he and I got into an argument about the religious right. He was very offended at my characterization of Eric Prince as a radical right-wing Christian. He said, that's him too. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and on one side of the room is like me and a handful of other people, and then on the other side of the room is the, all the industry lobbyists from Titan and Khaki and Blackwater, and, the, and they have a, a trade association, all of them together. It's called the International Peace Operations Association. <laughs> it's, I wish it was a joke, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's this Orwellian thing, and its logo is a cartoon sleeping lion, like something from a Disney movie or something. Uh, all right, well, I'm, I'm being told here that I have to uh, wrap up. I feel like I didn't even start my talk yet. Uh, um, I guess I, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll close in saying this.
Those four guys that got killed in Fallujah, the Iraqis had turned two football fields into mass graves, and he described the smell of death that had overtaken the city. And so this collective punishment was meted out against the people of Fallujah over the deaths, not of four U.S. soldiers, not of four U.S. civilians, but of four mercenaries sent there by a private and politically connected company. And the families of those four men, uh, like so many thousands of uh, American families, uh, went through a process of trying to figure out what had happened to their loved ones. And they, they discovered that Blackwater, they said, wasn't being transparent with them, wasn't being straightforward. And at one point, uh, one of the mothers of one of those guys killed says she was told by a Blackwater representative that if she wanted to see the company's investigation of their murder, uh, that she would have to sue the company. Uh, her son was killed. Her son had been in the military and special forces. All of them were special forces. You'll have to sue us if you want to know why your son was killed and what the circumstances were. Because they weren't in armored vehicles. They were sent out short two men, and they didn't have heavy weaponry on them. And so these families, after, after being told this to decide in January of 2005, we're going to take Blackwater up on their challenge, and we're going to sue Blackwater. So they filed a groundbreaking wrongful death lawsuit against Blackwater. It sent shivers and shockwaves through the war industry. Blackwater enlisted a high-powered team of attorneys. The original lawyer on the case was Fred Fielding who's now Bush's White House counsel, defending him against scandaldom. More recently, it was Kenneth Starr. They've had five, six different law firms representing them on this, all of them high-powered Republican law firms. And these families have their two lawyers from Santa Ana, California, and they're fighting Blackwater. And Blackwater hasn't made much, and I'll wrap up in a second, Blackwater hasn't made much of disputing the specific allegations of the families that their men were sent in unarmored vehicles, short two men without heavy weaponry, Instead, Blackwater put forward a very novel defense. They said, we can't be sued. And the reason Blackwater said it can't be sued is because Donald Rumsfeld recognized Blackwater as part of the U.S. total force, the U.S. war machine. And we should be entitled to the same immunity from civilian litigation for wrongful death enjoyed by the U.S. military. At the same time Blackwater made that argument, the company's high-paid lobbyists were waxing poetic in the media about how it would be inappropriate to apply the Uniform Code of Military Justice to Blackwater forces because we're civilians. So when it's convenient, we should get the immunity of the military, and when it's convenient, we should get the protection of civilians from being prosecuted in the court-martial system. And Blackwater was rejected at every level. They tried to get it thrown out, failed. They tried to get it removed to federal court, failed. Ken Starr twice appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, and even though John Roberts is the Chief Justice, and it's a Republican-dominated Supreme Court, twice the Supreme Court rejected it. So that trial was set to begin this past May. The, at the 11th hour, you have all this maneuvering happening behind the scenes. This was going to be the trial of the war. It was going to put the war contractor system on trial, public forum, jury in a state court in North Carolina, right in Blackwater's backyard. A jury of the peers was going to decide whether or not Blackwater was liable for the deaths of those four men, and, and then responsible for what comes after it, if you think about it. But at the last moment, Blackwater goes to a senior judge, almost retired, in the Eastern District of North Carolina, and somehow gets him to cast aside the rejections of the Supreme Court, to cast aside the rejections of the Fourth Circuit, to cast aside the rejections of the State Court, and they get him to order the case into private arbitration, where there will not be witnesses in the same way, it won't be open to the public, and the decision will, will likely be sealed. And what's perhaps most important is that there will be a gag imposed on those families from talking about it. And so it appears right now that Blackwater was able finally, after two years of battling this, to remove it from a public forum. And what they've done in an act of extraordinary cynicism is Blackwater USA, the powerful war contractor connected to the Bush White House, has filed a counterclaim against the estates of those four dead men seeking $10 million in damages. Blackwater says that the, the lawsuit violated their contracts that they signed that said they wouldn't sue Blackwater. And so now they're going to punish the estate's $10 million counterclaim against them. Now these families are, have put up a defense fund to keep the, uh, the case alive. So they're at the, at the one hand trying to fight this war contractor and on the other hand now facing the fact that the estates of their deceased sons and husbands are, are now being sued for $10 million by this powerful war contractor. Um, I'm happy to answer questions, and I want to end um, on this note, that uh, I, I think we, um, and I, I feel like I've said this a number of times at this very conference, but it's, it's true every single year, uh, we live in very dark times. Uh, we live in very violent and vicious and, and bloody times. Um, I just got back from, uh, from Bolivia. I was there for two weeks.
And I've never in my life seen a country uh, where the disparity between the haves and the have-nots is so stark. Bolivia has the, the largest percentage of indigenous population of any country in the world. And uh, it's, it's insane because you have the rich in Bolivia building themselves into these communities they call urbanizaciones, and they have their private security companies guarding the perimeter. And now the, the indigenous populations of Bolivia are becoming like the scorned street art that no one wants. They've been forced into the cities to try to make some kind of uh, money for themselves. And you have this, this incredible disparity between the rich and the poor. And it's a country that is, is truly ripe for an outright revolution. Now, the, the Evo Morales thing is very complicated, but Bolivia is ripe for an outright revolution. And, and, and when I, the reason I say that after saying we live in dark times is because I found it incredible. When you talk to so many indigenous Bolivians, the incredible spirit, it took them over 500 years to have an indigenous leader rise to power in that country. And whether people like him or not, there's a pride that, it, that the conquistadors are no longer running the presidency of Bolivia. And, and it's, it's moments like that, and it's the kind of people that we meet at this conference that give me great hope uh, that we can win. And, and you know what? It's not all about winning. I, I was just talking to a friend tonight and remembering the, the quote that I've mentioned before here, and I'll end on this, of Ammon Hennessy, the, the great anarchist who was protesting in front of the White House. He had been a World War I draft resistor, a war resistor. And uh, a newsman came up to him and says, you know, Mr. Hennessy, you're not going to change them, the men in the White House. And he goes, that might be true, but they're sure as hell not going to change me. Thank you very much. <laughs>